Thank you, Pastor BJ, for the reading of the scripture, and thank you for following along. I'm going to try to pick up a little bit where we left off last week. For the last several Sunday evenings, we've been talking about the family, and last week I talked with you a little bit about how that the scripture uses family truth sometimes to teach us spiritual truth. God will use the family analogy to teach us some things about himself and some dealings that God will have with us. This particular passage of Scripture is one of probably the most familiar to us of how that God uses the family relationship and his dealings with us, in particular when it comes to this matter of chastisement. This Scripture... um, is a scripture that I'd like to give you three things that I want you to underline or to mark in in your Bible so that you can follow along as we study together. In verse number five, there's a word that I'd like for you to underline if you write in your Bible. If not, you can highlight or just make a note to the side or on a separate sheet of paper. And you'll notice in verse number five the word forgotten. And I want you to underline or write that word down because what the apostle is saying here, he's telling these believers that there's a truth in God's Word that they have forgotten. And I I don't mean to oversimplify things, but this word literally means totally forgotten. They never think about it. It's something, he said, this is something that you just never think about anymore. And uh, it can be a problem. Now, certainly it can be a problem as we're talking about God's dealing with us and and him chastening us, but we've been talking about the family and the importance of discipline in the home, of training in the home, and I don't think that we have to take uh, but just a, a casual glance around us to see that parents in our society have forgotten their responsibility when it comes to the training of their children. It is the parent's place to train the children. It's not the churches. It's not the schools. It's not the daycares. Now listen, these institutions can come alongside and they can help. But God has given the responsibility of the training and the discipline of children to the parents. And so that's certainly something that's been forgotten that needs to be, our minds need to be quickened. We need to be shaken And we need to be brought to remembrance that there is a responsibility that comes with bearing children, and that is training them in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. And then there's a a word that's really, it's not a word, it's a thought, but I'm going to give you a word. And so there is a forgotten. So what is is the apostle saying here? He said there's a forgotten truth. Now, where do I get that? Notice what he said in verse number 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Now, what's he doing here? He's quoting Proverbs 3. So he's quoting a truth. He's saying you have forgotten a truth that should be pivotal into the training of your children and that should be pivotal in your spiritual maturity in your faith. And so he said there is a forgotten truth. And then if you'll drop down in verse number 7, he says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And so this is a family truth. And so I want you to write that word down, family. Now God is getting ready to teach us his dealings with us as his children And he said, I want you to think about how you as a father, and I don't think we'd be doing any harm to the Scripture to say how you as a parent, how you as a parent deal with your children. Now, God lays the responsibility on the father, but that that responsibility is empowered to the mother. And so he said, as a parent, you have a responsibility. It's a family truth. And the family truth is you are responsible for your children. And as we look at this, God is in essence telling us that He is responsible for us. It's a family truth. See, God is not dealing with the lost in a way that He deals with the saved. See, you will not deal with other people's children the way that you deal with your children. Now, I love all children. 
Sometimes I have to remind myself of that when I'm in Walmart. <laughs> Somebody say amen with me. Uh, well, I give Walmart a hard time, don't I? I have to remind myself when I'm in public and I see children acting the way they act in an in a irreverent, disrespectful manner toward their parent or guardian. I have to remind myself, Dale, you love children. Dale, you love children. Dale, you love... I just have to keep repeating that so that I'll not do anything that, well, you'd have to come bail me out of jail for. So... I do love children, and you know that. We love children here. We love children, and we're reaching out, and we're trying to make a difference in the lives of the children. We want to train them. The reason you see young gushers, and you see young pianists, and you see young, fine young men and fine young ladies up here singing, and we're trying to teach them that there's nothing greater that they can do with their life than to serve Jesus Christ with it. And we want to start them early, brethren. We don't want to wait till they, you know, uh, graduate high school or we don't want to wait till they, they, they hit the, you know, 16, 18, 21. No, I, I believe you start young. You train them up. Train them up. Let them know you can serve God with your life. As a matter of fact, I think it was Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said that there's a lot of folks that waited about 16 years and 200 pounds too late to start disciplining and training their children. So don't wait till your children get up and grown now and then try to interest them in serving God with their life. Teach them young, brethren. Teach them young to serve God with their life. And God wants us to get started young. God is interested in the children. A family truth here is that as parents, as fathers, we are to get involved into the lives of our children, and that shows that we love them. Now, I want to make a statement here, and I challenge you to, to go and prove this statement. An undisciplined child is a child that doesn't feel loved. An undisciplined child is a child that feels unloved. They go together. A, a child that receives no discipline feels unwanted, unloved, like there's no interest there. So God disciplines me, and that teaches me that he's interested in my life. I care that you're doing wrong. I, 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 I'm interested in the direction you take in your life. This is the message that God sends to me and God sends to you as a believer when he gets involved in our lives in this matter of discipline and chastening. And so it's a family truth, and we'll talk a little about that. And then finally, in verse number 11, there's a word there uh, right in the middle. It's fruit, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I want you to think about that. It's, there is a fruitful truth. And so here's three things that I think would be easy to remember, okay? There's a, a forgotten truth. And I don't think that we're going to have to really press too hard to show that this truth has been forgotten. And I want you and I to be reminded again of our responsibility to our family, to our children, and then our responsibility to God as He gets involved in our lives in this form of discipline and in chastening. And then there's a family truth. God has drawn some simple family truths here to teach us some truths about not only how we should deal with our family and our children, but how that we, in part, as His children, as He disciplines us. It teaches us that God is involved and He is intimate in His care for the outcome of our life. And discipline proves that. Discipline proves, proves that. Now, the devil, of course, will try to have us to think, well, if, if God loved you, he wouldn't do this. If God loved you, he wouldn't allow this. No, it is because God does love us that these things happen, you see. And so we must not fall prey to the lie of the enemy. And that is that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Now, that's the word of God. It's the truth. The enemy says, oh, because God is chastening you. Because God is allowing you to go through this form of chastening, whatever it may be. It could be financial. It could be physical. It, it, could, be, it could be even spiritually. Listen, whatever form and however God allows chastening to come into our lives, that doesn't prove that God doesn't love us. It, it's an evidence that He does. Amen? And then finally, it works. Chastening works. Now, there's three things that Dr. Bill Rice taught me years ago. Number one, chastening is necessary. <laughs> Amen. It's necessary. I, I realize that we live in a day where we, we, we don't want to come to, to, to grips with that in terms with the fact 
that chastening is necessary. It's necessary that I as a father administer it to my children, and it's necessary that God, my father, administer it to me. Because every child of God is going to be chastened. Did you hear what I just said? Every child of God is going to be chastened. You're going to be chastened. Now, that's not because God's angry at you. As a matter of fact, and I would like to be able to stand before you as a father and tell you that I've never chastened my children when I was angry, but my children are in the congregation tonight, and they would have to stand up for rebuttal on that one. But there have been times that I have chastened my children when I was angry, and I do not recommend that. I do not recommend it. And I'm going to teach you in just a few moments, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm glad that God is perfect. Now, I'm not perfect. I've made many mistakes as a parent and as a father. And there's just some things I wish I could do over, but unfortunately, there's some things you only get one go around that. But I'm glad that God makes no mistakes. See, my heavenly Father has never made a mistake with me like I made with my children. Aren't you glad of that? God knows... He, he makes no mistakes. He knows what type of chastening is needed. He knows when the chast chastisement is needed. He, God just knows these things, and I'm so thankful for that. And so I can place myself in His loving arms and in His loving care with full assurance that God is going to do right every time. Every time, brethren. And you can as well. Every time. We can trust Him Amen. to do right every time. Now, so I learned from Dr. Rice... It's necessary. I, I learned from Dr. Rice that it works. It works. Chastening works. I want to talk to you tonight just a little bit. Why chastisement? It works. Look, if you would, in verse number 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In other words, there's results. It works. Now, I've, tried to, I've had people try to tell me, and, and I've gotten into some fairly heated debates over this as a pastor and, and as a Christian, when people try to tell me, well, you know, you preach this discipline thing, but I've tried it and it doesn't work, and I've had to tell them, I beg your pardon. God's Word is always right. And God says it does work. And so either you're doing it wrong or something's not right. Because I'm here to tell you that God said it does work. And it does work, brethren. It works. So I'm not going to allow someone to tell me that what God said is not so or it doesn't work. It does work. And chastening does work. It works when God chastens me. It works when God chastens you. And it works when we chasten our children. So discipline, training, chastening works because the Bible says so. Not because I said so. Not because there's, there's results in, in my children or your children. And there may be and there may not be. I don't know, but I know this. I know God says it works, so it works. Amen. All right? It works. So let's look at this. Number one, a forgotten truth. A forgotten truth. He said in verse number five, ye, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Now here we are. He said, you forgot. What they forget? They forgot a very important truth. And it's an exhortation, which simply means it's an encouragement, brethren. Listen to me now. See, this is not given to threaten us. See, a lot of people, when they think of chastening, they think of discipline, they think of a threat. Because really, to most people, that's what, it, that's what it's become to them. If you don't stop that, I'm going to... And boy, it just goes on and on and on. It's almost... If it wasn't so sad, it would be funny. When you hear people give all the threats you know if i have to tell you one more time i am so tired of hearing that i am so tired of hearing that listen if you're going to do it get it done if you're not quit talking about it amen children don't need threats they need action and so he said you've forgotten the exhortation that's a very important word this is an encouragement god said I don't want you to take this matter of chastening as a discouragement to allow it to dishearten you. And he elaborates on that even more in just a moment. He said, but you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. And then he gives the truth that has been forgotten. <coughs> Excuse me, Proverbs chapter 3, verse number uh, 9, 10, 11 there. In that section, he said, my son, 
Despise thou not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now here's what God is telling you and me. Through the apostle here, he's saying this. He's saying you've forgotten the truth. And the truth you have forgotten was meant to encourage you. To be encouraged that God is going to become intimately involved in your life for the direction of your life to get you to where he wants you to be. See, God wants us to be well-rounded. If you look down in verse number 11, that last phrase there, unto them which are exercised thereby. See, chastening makes us healthy. Now listen to me. Chastening makes, it makes us healthy. That word exercise, it, it's, it, it literally means a workout. Chastening makes us well-rounded. It makes us balanced. When, when you find someone without chastisement in their life, they're unbalanced. And so God provides chastening in our lives, and he said that we are to provide chastening and discipline into the lives of our children for the purpose of us reaching our fullest potential. That's what God wants. And I believe that's what we want. I've never met a parent that wouldn't tell you, I want, I want the fullest potential of my child. Well, now, if we do, we're going to have to get involved in this matter of chastisement and of rebuke and of instruction, the word correction, is mentioned here, corrected. Notice, if you would, let me find it here, verse number 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. So you see, all of these elements are involved in the training, in the teaching, in the molding of a child, and then us as God's child. So we can't forget this truth. We can't forget that God loves us. And because God loves us, he loves us so much, and I think someone said that God, uh, I think Brother Michael was talking about that God's too good to us. God loves us too much to allow us just to do what we want to do. See, God loves us so much, He's going to chasten us and direct us to do what He bids us to do because that's what's best. So don't take God's chastisement as God's angry at you or God's uh, God doesn't love you or that God doesn't want what's best for you. It's all the opposite. God wants what's best. He wants us to reach our fullest potential. He wants us to grow and mature in the faith. He wants to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And so because of that, he's got, listen, he's got to kind of whip us into shape. I mean, we're, 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 we're kind of uh, whacked up, <laughs> you know. We, we're messed up, and we get out of line. And God deals with us because he loves us, so he gets involved. I'm glad that my God cares that much about me, aren't you? Amen. You see, there's a group out here teaching, brethren. Listen, they're teaching that God made us, and then he just left us to ourselves. There's nothing further from the truth. God is intimately involved in our, the affairs of his own. Now, remember how it was when, when your children were smaller, and maybe there was a group of children playing, and, and maybe they got out of hand a little bit. I don't know what it could have been, but they got out of hand a little bit, and so you had to go out and you had to deal with it. Now, though you were concerned about all the children that were involved in that incident, let me assure you that there was one, two, or three, ever how many children you had involved in that incident that you were particularly interested in. That's the way it is with God. God, listen, God loves mankind. But God is particularly interested in the outcome of your life as his child. God has a purpose for your life, and he's particularly involved that you fulfill that purpose. Now, God, the, the, the interest that God has in those that are not saved is pardon. But the interest that God has in your life and mine is purpose, and thus the chastening. Okay? So this forgotten truth, God is, is involved. Now, let me ask you to turn to a scripture to look, if you would, to Psalm 119. If you have studied any of King David's life, you know that King David had to have the chastening hand of God applied to his life to reach the fullest potential. In Psalm 119, King David makes a statement that every time I read it, it just, it, it, it challenges me afresh to remember that chastening is God's way of letting me know that he loves me. Psalm 119, look at verse 67. David said this, 
David said this, before, Psalm 119, verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Can I tell you, when God gives you a little whipping, it'll put you straight. Now, there's not a person here that's been saved that God hasn't had to give a little whipping to. All right? And there's different levels. There's rebuke, there's chastisement, there's scourging. And we won't have time to go into that tonight. But I am going to go into it, the Lord willing, we'll go into it another time. Because, listen, there, there's, listen, there's sin that will make you sick. Now, I'm not saying that all sickness is because of sin, but according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, listen, there's sin that will make you sick. There's sin that will kill you. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that dies is because they, they sin, but I do say this, everybody that sins will die. <laughs> Amen. So, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Don't, don't leave here and say, well, the preacher said, listen, I don't know what God's doing in your life. You need to be careful about that. Sometimes we Christians, we get real judgmental. We'll sit back and say, well, you know, that's God's chastisement. Well, it may be. I don't know. Say, I don't know what God's doing in your life. And you really don't know what God's doing in my life because you don't know my heart and I don't know yours. This thing of chastisement is personal, right? Now, sometimes, I don't know, about, I don't know how it was done at your house. But sometimes at my house, boy, I hated these times. I hated it. See, my sin can affect you. You do know that. See, we're, we're a family, brethren. And what I do, listen, I'm the pastor of this church, and the way I live is going to affect you. By the way, you're a part of this church, and the way you live is going to affect me and us. So it does matter how we live. Say amen with me now. And I remember when, when we were growing up, my brother's here to testify to this, and if you never got this, then uh, God bless you. But uh, we, we, we were, uh, I, sometimes it was hard to know what my mother wanted. Amen. I mean, she would say, don't you come in here tattletelling. I'll whip you just for tattletelling. I thought, well, okay, I'm not going to tattletale. And then the next day she'd say, you tell me who done that, I'm going to whip you too. Well, like, wait a minute. What in the world? Man, I couldn't win. That happened around your house, Annie. I can remember, I can remember my mother saying, who done that? And we'd all just sit there. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. The rock just jumped out of somebody's hand and went through that window. I, I don't know. All right. Line up. Boy, when my mama said line up, we knew what was coming. We knew what was coming. We was all going to get it. And you talking about confession. You want to get confession out of somebody? My mama could get confession out of you. Say amen right there. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Mama can get some confession out of you. Well, I'll tell you right now. And we'd all get it. She said, I'm going to get the right one. Wow. You know, so I think I'm going to try that at home. Don't try this at home, all right? What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that God will afflict, God will chase him. Look what David said. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. See, why, why, does, God, why does God chasten me, preacher? Because God loves you. God doesn't want you going astray. God wants to teach you to stay in line. God wants to teach you that, that sin is going to get you in deeper trouble than what you know about. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will cost you more than you want to pay. And sometimes God will chasten us to teach us that because he doesn't want us to get into a place of our life of ruin and wreck. Notice what else he said in verse 67. But now I have kept thy word. You know, when God... Provides a little chastisement. It straightens us up, doesn't it? It really does. It's the same with our children. It really is. Look at verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. So here I am. This is just a few verses later. I believe David was thinking several years later. Here I am far removed from the whippings that my mother gave me. And I look back and, boy, I say, my mama was a hero. Hey, Amen. She whooped the fire out of me. You ever had the fire whooped out of you? And the tar? Hey, Amen. I got the fire and the tar whooped out of me. You know what I'm talking about? My grandmother and my mother. How many of you witnessed now? You know, you, you got it at home. I'm talking about you got a whooping, brother. I'm not talking about this little patty cake that they give at, at the, down at the drugstore and I've seen them give them little patty cakes. Man, them patty cakes don't get anything. All that does is, 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 is make a child contentious and, and you give them what's coming to them. And I'm going to tell you right now, the war will be ended. War is over. You want peace? You got, listen, you got to calm the storm and end the war. 
What did David say? Look at verse 71. We're talking about a forgotten truth here. The law, verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. You feel a little contentious with God? You feel a little friction in your relationship with God? You feeling like there's something missing there? Can I tell you that if God needs to, he'll chasten you to get you in line so that you can have that peace in your heart and you begin to get back in that maturation process where God will mature us and help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so we can reach our fullest potential better. That's what this book teaches. So don't take what God's doing in your life as, well, God doesn't love me. Yes, God does love you. That's why he's dealing with you. It's because he loves you. And this seems to have been a forgotten truth. It seems that folks are living today like, you know what? It doesn't matter how I live. God's not going to require it. It doesn't matter about my sin. I'm saved now. I'm under grace. And, and it doesn't matter. You know, I, I can just live and do as I choose. God will forgive me. Let me tell you, God will forgive you, but he'll chasten you too. If you're saved, now listen to me. This is what this book teaches. And he won't chasten you because he doesn't love you. He'll chasten you because he cares and he does love you. All right? Now turn back to... Hebrews chapter number 12, and let's look at this second thought. Now, there's much more in here, okay? As I mentioned, I, I, I want to preach a message on, on the three phases of the believer's life, the past, the present, the future, because God deals with sin differently in our lives in these aspects. See, our past sin's already been forgiven, brother. That, that took place at Calvary. Our future sin is going, uh, going to be really, we're going to answer as a servant, not as a sinner. We answered as a, a sinner at Calvary. We're going to answer as a servant at the beam of the judgment seat. But we're answering as sons right here. And that's what the Scripture is teaching. Right now, presently, we're answering to God as sons of God. And He's our Father. And He's going to deal with us as His sons. In the future, God's going to deal with us as servants. That's at the judgment seat of Christ. In the past, He dealt with us at, at Calvary. Our sins were dealt with. And therefore, there is now no condemnation to we which are in Christ Jesus. See, when you get this, then you begin to understand a little bit about God's dealings in your life presently. And it'll help us to understand why God is doing what he's doing. It's because he loves us. Now look at this family truth, and then I'll, I'll make a statement or two about that. Notice if you would here in verse number 7. If ye endure chastening. Wow. I went, I've got that word underlined in my Bible. Because I went, listen, when I, got it, when I got it, I endured it. I didn't enjoy it. Amen. I didn't. I, I, I don't understand. I, and, and folks could leave. I, there's probably already people think, I tell you right now, Pastor Freeman, uh, it, it's a wonder any of his kids are still alive. He must have beat the daylights out of them. Well, I, I, I hope I beat the devil out of them. <laughs> Not the daylights. I don't believe in child abuse. No, I don't. And anyone that knows me well knows that. I am, I am adamantly opposed to any form of abuse. Not just child. I, I'm not for abuse, period. Abuse of a woman, abuse of, of any person. I'm just not for abuse. A child, I'm not for it. But I am for biblical teaching and what it teaches. And so he said in verse number 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now think about that for a moment. I, I closed last week's message by saying first, first century Christianity and, 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 and this century's Christianity has changed a whole lot. Not a whole lot of fathers chastening their sons. That's why we've got a bunch of rebels. That's why our detention centers are filling up. That's why people are cursing their parents out. One of my children, listen, I, one of my children even rolled their eyes at me. I gave them a whipping. You say, well, that's, that's wrong. Well, you call it what you want. Don't have no child roll their eyes at me. Don't you even look like you're about to roll your eyes. Matter of fact, best thing you can do is close your eyes if you're about to roll them. Amen? I'll roll you. Amen? I don't put up with that stuff. And you shouldn't put up with it either. Let your children roll their eyes at you. Talk back to you. Tell you, I'm not going to do it. Oh, okay. We're going to take care of that. I'm not going to do it, Spirit. Amen? You say, well, now, preacher, what, what can you do with them? Well, I can tell you a lot you can do with them. It's right here in this book right here. The question is not what you can do with them. It's are you going to do it with them? Now, it says right here, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Now, watch it. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Every one of God's children get chastened. 
You say, I haven't been chasing uh, preacher. Well, I've got some news for you, and it's not so good. So I want you to follow along. Look at verse number 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. You're illegitimate. You don't belong to God. You're lost. That's why God's not chastening you. Now, I don't say that. Listen, I do not say that with a smart attitude. I say that with a burden in my heart. Because you cannot sin and get by. Ultimately, no one will sin and get by. Every sin will be punished. No sin goes unpunished, brethren. Boy, don't we live in a generation that has forgotten that? No wonder the, 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 the writer said, you have forgotten. Well, we've forgotten that there is no sin that goes unpunished. You say, but I'm a believer. Yeah, I know. God's going to deal with that sin in a special way. So the family matter is, the family truth is, that if you're a son, your father's going to deal with you. Now, why does God do that? Let's look and see what it says in verse number 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Now think about that for a moment. Here's a man under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God that says fathers are correcting their children. I wonder if God could move on a man today to write that since God's Word is pure truth. <laughs> Not many fathers correcting their children anymore, brother. You see how we've changed? See, the writer could write it with ease and it's absolute truth. God's Word is absolute truth. He said, you know, it's just, it's, just a common, it's, a, it's just a common fact. Fathers correct their children. But we've lost that in our society today. We've lost it. And that's why we're dealing with some of the problems that we're dealing with with the next generation, these millennials. They're soft. They're soft. They have no direction. They don't have any grit about them. They don't have any stability. They're not well-rounded. They're not, look at the latter part of verse number 11, they're not exercised. They're not, they're not reaching their fullest potential because there's no discipline. There's no structure. There's no guidance. There's no training. There's no molding in their lives. They're just left to do as they please. And when every man does, does that which is right in his own eyes, the Bible's already re, uh, recorded what happens to those generations. And here we are. So God help me and God help you to understand this on a, on a physical, natural level, but also on a spiritual level. Let's read on in verse number 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Look at this next phrase, and we gave them reverence. Now I want you to listen to me, Dad. And, I, and, and I'm being caring and loving here when I say this. and not, I'm not saying this in any other way, but just I care. If your children do not respect you, it may not be your children's fault. All right? Now, I didn't say it wasn't. I said it may not. Because this verse of Scripture teaches me that if I am instilling the proper correction, instruction, discipline, chastisement into my children's life, they're going to respect me for it. Can I tell you I respect my mother? Now, my mother, and, and listen, my mother's in heaven. I believe she got saved. She wasn't the best Christian. She didn't get saved later in life. And I don't say that any other way. I love my mother. And anyone that knows me knows I love my mother. My grandmother's a great Christian lady, my mother's mother. There's not two ladies in all the world other than that lady right there, my wife, that I have more respect for. Why? This verse of Scripture coming to life, that's why. Because God's never wrong. God's never wrong. When you instill discipline, into your children, they will respect you. They will respect you. They will reverence you. That's what the Bible says. Isn't it, brethren? I'm telling you, listen. I know, I know we look around today and we don't see a lot of reverence among the young to their parents. But I don't know that it's the children that we need to be looking to to blame. Because the Bible says right here that our fathers of our flesh corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more be in, rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Now, because 
God disciplines me. And I want you to get this thought, and I've got one more, and I'll be through for tonight, and we'll pick this up another time. Because there's so much in here. All right, so we're just kind of scratching the surface. A family truth. Don't miss this. You say, well, God loves me, so he chastens me. That's right. But guess what God's chastening does for you? It certainly tells us that God loves us. But guess what else it does? It causes us to reverence him. That's what this verse of Scripture is teaching. People that have this nonchalant, flippant attitude toward God, it's because they do not recognize the truth that has been forgotten that we have covered here, the forgotten truth of God's dealing in their life in the form of chastisement. But when we get honed in to these things that are happening in our lives and we don't wring our hands and say, why is this happening? But we realize this is God perfecting my faith. This is God working in my heart. This is God perfecting me and, 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 and causing me to be a, a, a perfected, growing, maturing saint of God. I reverence him for it, that God would go to work in my life, that God would care that much to get involved in my life. It brings about reverence. And so that's the family truth. And again, there's so much more. There's so much more. And we'll, we'll look at it. But look, if you would, in verse number 10, 11 and 12, and we'll look at the fruit, the fruitful truth, okay? So we have the forgotten truth, the family truth. Let's look at the fruitful truth. Now, no chastening for the present. And I, if you would, underline it, because there's two things that the apostle wants us to see here. The present, in verse number 11, and then right down, uh, uh, oh, right after that, it says, nevertheless, afterward. So when chastening has these two phases in it. There's the present, and then there's the afterward. Now, nobody likes the present. I, I, I just don't like, I, I never liked whipping my children. I just didn't. I felt, I don't know, I just, I didn't like it. Yeah, I don't even like to be around when somebody else is whipping their children. Well, I can't say maybe not some. <laughs> you know, when, when that mother has for the 50th time said, if you do that one more time, when she jerks her child up, I don't know, I kind of smile in my heart like, man, I've been wondering when you're going to do that, woman. <laughs> Amen. No. <laughs> well, yes, actually, yes. Uh, <laughs> the present and then afterward. All right? Don't miss this. It's just not fun. Maybe that's why folks don't do it. it it's, it's not pleasant. Is that what the Scripture says? No chastening for the present seemeth pleasant you know it, it's not fun 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 but it's right 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 and that's what we have to get focused on well preacher i don't like to do it i i i just i it, it grieves me to have to do it well you know the bible says look at it in verse number 11 no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous it is grievous and i don't think that he's talking about just the receiver See, I think God grieves when he looks down and he, and he says, you know, I, I've got to do this. It's for your own good. You say, I think I've heard that before. Yeah, you probably have. If you grew up in the kind of home that I think that most of you did, you probably heard that quite a few times. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Now you understand that, right? Now I want you to think of God that way. See, God, God it, hurt, it, it hurts the heart of God to have to do some things he has to do to get us to do what we ought to do. Say amen with me. We just ought to do it because it's the right thing to do. And yet we won't. And so God has to instill discipline and chastening into our lives. And it is grievous to the Lord. It grieves the heart of God. Just like it grieves your heart when you have to discipline one of your children. However, the scripture says this. Nevertheless, afterward, and I like the way it's worded here, it yieldeth. I like that. Amen. It brings forth a fruit. It brings forth some results. It works. It yieldeth the peaceable. Now, what I've done in my Bible is in verse number 10, I've underlined two words, prophet and partakers. And then I went down to verse number 11, and I highlighted peaceable. Now, here's what is accomplished in chastisement. It's, it's profitable for you and I to be chastened. It's profitable. And then second of all, as we are chastened, the prophet is that we become partakers of his holiness. God, 
conforms us more into his image. Isn't that a wonderful thing for God to do for you and I? To make us more like himself. Isn't that wonderful? That God would get involved in our lives like that to do that for us. I love that the Lord cares that much about me. Now, listen, I, I'm not going to stand here and even pretend that I like God's chastening in my life. But I will say this, and God knows my heart. I'm glad that God cares enough about me, and God has whipped me good, brethren. I mean, sometimes I feel like God really loves me. Amen. <laughs> you know? How about you? Can you look back over the course of your life and see the hand of God as he's molded and chastened and began to do a work in your life and some of the things that have come about. And now you look back just like you do in your, your physical relation. You say, you know, I'm glad God did that. I wouldn't be where I am today, spiritually speaking, had God not done that. Just like I can look back and say, you know, if my mama, if she wouldn't have done it, my dad left our home. I didn't have a, listen, I have a father figure. And you know that. Some of you did. But my mom could whip you like a man. You trust me when I tell you. I am so thankful for that now. When I look back over my life, I am so thankful that my mother didn't just let me do what I want to do and go, and, you know, I was, I was just as wild and just, just I, I don't even want to get into that. But I'm glad my mother just put the stop sign up and said, oh, no, boy, not here, not now, not, un not under this roof. You think you're going to do that? Uh-uh. You do that, you're going to get this. And she gave it. And it, it, it would pay you as a parent to instill some discipline. Okay? It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That means it'll make you to do right acts. That's what righteousness is. Right acts. It makes you act right. Right? So you're not acting right. So what, what happens? Well, you get the whipping. Then what? You act right. <laughs> Remember when, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick up on this. Our time is up tonight. We'll pick up on this. The Lord will in a couple of weeks from now. I'm glad Brother Shane's going to be preaching for us next Sunday night, and you won't want to miss that. But we'll pick up on it in a couple of weeks, and we'll finish our study on this matter. Of, we're just going to talk about the family all summer long in our Sunday evening services. I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. I'm glad God cares about my life, and God has whipped me. I mean, He has really whipped me. And I know that if you're saved, God's whipped you too. And I'm glad that God, I'm glad God disciplines me. I'm just thankful for it. I wouldn't be where I'm at and I wouldn't be who I am without the chastening hand of God in my life. Nor would you. Nor would you. And so, while it may be difficult, we ought to be thankful for God's involvement in the chastening of our lives. And one day, your little children, sir, and many of you, in our congregation have little children and they may not listen they may get angry at you and they may they may tell you that you know all kinds of things I don't know I don't know what happens in your home but I want you to be consistent in this matter of chastisement and chastening and training you say preacher will it ever will it ever click well there's parents here that raise some children and they're here to tell you now if they would testify tonight they thought like you're thinking right now. Will it ever kick in? Is it ever going to click? Will they ever get it? You stay consistent, and yes, it will click. Yes, it will kick in. Be consistent now. Don't be inconsistent. Don't, don't faint. Don't grow weary. All right? Just, just be consistent. Stay consistent. All right? All right. Let's all stand to our feet. This matter of chastisement is important. Let me ask you a question. Is the chastening hand of God effective in your life? Is it present? Can you look back over the course of your life, just like you can physically now? I guarantee you, you've got some whippings from mom or dad or whoever your guardian was that you, you will never forget. If you've got whippings now, now I'm not talking, like I said, I'm not talking about these patty cakers. Eh? I'm not talking about... If you've got some whippings that made an impact and a change in your life, you've got some that you've never forgotten. And maybe you didn't respond to it then the way you do now. As you look back now, you're thinking, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad. I have to say this. I was the one in the family that, that when my mama whipped me, 
I, I, I tried to make her think she was killing me. I did. Now, now, now my brother back there, you can tell by looking at him, he's hard-headed. He, he, he was the one that tried to, you know, stone up like, you're not going to hurt me, man. She, I mean, she did. You think she let up on kind of that? No. She just kept, kept frailing away. And I mean, she, I, she wouldn't even hit me and I'd already be, you know, you're killing me. <laughs> she hadn't even hit me the first time. But I found a secret of that. Yeah, amen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, how'd that work for you? Amen. <laughs> My mother's one of those who kind of take you in a circle. You know about that circle? And I, I learned the closer you get to her, now, hey, there's a great spiritual lesson here. I didn't realize this later. The closer you get to her, the less it hurt. It did. Man, you stand back at the art. I mean, you, you let her get full extension, you're in trouble. Somebody say amen with me. You know what I'm talking about? Full extension. You're, you, you're in trouble and a fool. Amen. But, you know, the closer you get to the Lord, really the less painful. I'm not saying the less useful or helpful i said the less painful the closer you get in the moments of chastisement learn that learn that love god for his chastening he loves you to chasten love him for his chastening of you let's bow our heads together i'm so glad that my god loves me rather than god loves us more than we could ever comprehend